for one, September the 18th is our quarterly debt retirement contribution. Uh, be prayerfully considering tripling your contribution on that day to take care of our building, uh, building obligations. Uh, two other announcements. If you've signed up for the Heartfelt Mom, uh, there's going to be a meeting in room C9 immediately after services this evening. So if you've signed up for that part of our women's ministry, or even if you have questions about that, please go to C9 after our services this evening. We also want to encourage you to uh, men to check the update, our update emails that are going out to sign up for the men's leadership workshop that's going to take place at Freed Hardman University. Uh, that's going to be coming up soon. You can check uh, for the date and the information on that. And we need you to sign up uh, by the end of the week if you're interested in going on that uh, good, uh, good activity. Do we have any other announcements? Well, tonight, Dr. Barry England is not here with us tonight, but he's given me a lot of his notes. So we're going to be uh, continuing on with our series uh, looking at marriage, and tonight we're going to be looking at God's plan versus Satan's plan, and I know our study of God's Word will be profitable. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Before our prayer, we'll sing, There's Not a Friend. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. None else could heal all our soul's diseases. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one. No, not one, and yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. There's not an hour that he is not near us. 
No, not one. No, not one. No, night so dark, but his love can cheer us. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. go to God in prayer. God, we come to you tonight and just thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity to learn more about you and to worship you and to uh, just take take time of our, our busy schedule to focus on you. And we thank you for the, the singing uh, that we have tonight, the missionaries that are across all the world uh, spreading the gospel, the good news. Thank you for the opportunities that we have to serve one another each day, and we hope we, we ask that you help us find those opportunities to help one another. Uh, I just thank you for the blessings that we enjoy, and thank you for helping us while we struggle with whatever aspects of life that we may encounter each day as we go about our lives. I want to thank you for Christ who died on the cross for our sins and gave us an avenue for forgiveness and grace and to remain close to you. We come to you tonight and ask you to be with you know, the families uh, of the congregation and please be with the sick, those in need, those that are grieving. Uh, please be with us as we go about our daily walk as Christians and as we aim to grow. Uh, please be with us during the, the trials and the hardships, and be with us during the rest of the week. Um, and lastly, uh, I ask you to be with anybody that is uh, wrestling with the decision to put on Christ, and please be with them during those thoughts. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our lesson tonight, we'll sing, Not a Step Without Jesus. Uh, at this time, kids may go to their classes. And if you like, you may stand. Not a step will I take without Jesus Is the vow that my heart has made Though I often am tempted to leave him Yet unto him my heart is stayed Not a step will I take not a step without him will I go. He will lead me along to that beautiful home over there. Not a step will I take without Jesus as I travel upon life's way. Though temptations may be all around me, I will follow my Lord each day. Not a step will I take, not a step without Him will I go. He will lead me along to that beautiful home over there. Not a step will I take without Jesus. 
Where he leads I can never stray From the path that will lead me to glory To that land of eternal day Not a step will I take Not a step without him will I go He will lead me along To that beautiful home over there It is good to see each and every one of you here tonight. I believe there's nothing greater that we can be doing than to come tonight and focus on God's Word, especially when it comes to the family. Uh, whenever you think about our country and you think about what's gone on even in the last 50 years within our country, I think it's very easy to say that when you come to the topic of building marriage around God and doing it His way, uh, that marriage is under attack. Uh, whenever you come to marriage today, Satan has waged war against Christian families. Uh, especially uh, against the idea of marriage. Because Satan wants to transform marriages uh, from two people, we've sort of talked about that, two people that are cares for and interested in each other. And one of the things that uh, Barry's mentioned many times is it's very easy to just drift into a relationship where you're just sort of living life in the same location but drifting past each other, not becoming the wow marriage uh, that we would all want. So as we think about God's plan tonight, we're going to be looking at some things uh, that are challenges to that. Uh, marriage is definitely under attack. If you were to go back and look in America in the 1950s and you looked at divorce or you looked at divorce rates, uh, we would be shocked, uh, many that are younger, at what marriage was like then, the number of people. If we ask our grandparents how many of them knew somebody in their class that was divorced, it was very, very few. Uh, divorce rates doubled. Uh, after that period, it got to 1965, it doubled again, divorce rates, uh, people that were splitting up in their marriages. Uh, but then in 1980, divorce rates started to go down. And whether you're aware of it or not, divorce continued to decrease ever since 1980. So obviously marriage is doing better, right? No. Just the idea of marriage altogether in many ways has been thrown out the window by our society. Uh, people are not getting married anymore. Back then, about 70% of Americans were married to someone else. Today, you are now in the minority if you are married to someone else and you're married to a person you live at home with. Uh, a couple years ago, it finally dropped below 50%. We're at about 48, 49% of our population has even decided to be in this relationship called marriage. What happens? Well, cohabitation, of course, has gone up. The idea of getting married is scary to many people today. Uh, some people have lost the picture of what marriage ought to be. 1965, average age of two people getting married. For girls, it was about 19 years old. For men, it was about 21 years old. Now somebody gets married at that age and everybody's worried, right? What in the world's going on? Uh, today, average age of marriage for a woman is about 28 years old. For a man, it's 30. People are putting off the idea of marriage. Uh, I was at a, while we were at Horizons, John Allen and Hannah, our son, had just gotten married. He's, uh, they're 22, they'd just gotten out of college. And uh, a lady that was there had a daughter who had also gotten married. And she asked us straight faced, as we, Natalie and I were talking to her about it, she said, well, what did like all of their friends tell them? Did anybody ask them, what in the world are you doing getting married? Why aren't you like living together first and making sure this thing would work? Now, this, was at a, this wasn't her opinion, but this is what had happened to her child in a, you know, whatever public school they were going to. The idea is, why in the world would you get married? Why not just live together? Why not just try that out? Why even, you know, why in the world would you commit to something like that at this age? Did you have negative peer pressure against the idea of getting married and for the idea of ignoring God's plan for marriage? Well, it was sort of surprising to me, but I don't think that's uncommon at all. There's a lot of people that would say, now, you believe what? 
1965, the world, our country, our society said, yeah, well, about anybody could say, this is probably what you ought to do. Maybe a number of people aren't doing that, but this is what, you know, this is the best plan for things. And now today, as I did even more study, I taught marriage and the family for years at Columbia Academy. As I was doing even more study today, the information and the studies that they're putting out there are like, yeah, this marriage thing may not even be that good for people. Psychology today, and I'm reading information, we're going, yeah, I don't know if it really makes people happy or not. Now, again, if we go back and look at what was happening 60 years ago with family, what was happening with society, with all of the ills that we have today, I think we could point to all kinds of problems that have come because of a breaking down of the American home. Uh, but what we can't do as God's people, and what we don't need to do tonight as we come together is just look back and say, well, that's how it used to be. We have to look forward when it comes to God's plan. We have to think about the society that we live in, not the one that we wish we had. We don't need to romanticize the past. We need to look at issues that have brought that same mindset that was in the 60s has brought about in many ways the problems that we have within marriage today. But what I know without a doubt is the solution to any of these problems or struggles, the solution is to go back to God's plan. And that's what we're going to try to do tonight as we look at a number of different things. I told Rhett in the back that whatever they pay him, they need to double it tonight. I think, I'm not sure what you double zero is, but Rhett, thank you for volunteering tonight. I've got a lot of Barry's lessons, but you've got a problem. I can't give it somebody else's lesson. So he gave me his stuff, and then I put my stuff in, and you may just get a lot faster lesson tonight. But I think we've got a lot of great things to look at. What I want us to do is, number one, look at just the Bible basis for marriage. This may be something that uh, you need further instruction on. Many of you may say, okay, I know that. And it's sort of like what Barry's talked about. A lot of these things aren't things that are new to us. It's whether or not we're going to be motivated to do them. But in our society today, we do not need to take it for granted that people understand what God's plan for marriage is. We need to internalize that as disciples of Jesus Christ. What does God want out of my marriage? Because that needs to determine how I'm going to act and how I'm going to handle situations. So we want to look at exactly what God has said. I believe this can also help us as we talk to other people. Other people do not just assume and think about their marriage or their relationships. If you're trying to help them, this is not always the basis that they have for those relationships. So we're going to look at that. Then we're going to look at the idea of a compare and contrast. God's plan versus Satan's plan, and we're going to look at those two and the effects and the attitudes that lead to those two choices, and then we'll try to get to the end and look at some suggestions that can help us as well as we consider these things. First, I want to look at a description of the family who follows God's way. Uh, whenever you look at this idea, obviously we go back to Genesis chapter 2 where God was going to create man. Uh, if you had your Bibles and you were looking in Genesis 2, you would see in verse 18 the idea that he says it's not good for man to be alone. He saw all of his creation and the one thing that he wanted to correct was that Adam was alone and there was no Eve. Find it interesting that there in verses 19 and 20, he brings all the animals before Adam and he says, look, what are you going to call this? And what are you going to call it? And he names all of the animals in a very interesting phrase in there. It says, but for Adam, there wasn't found a, a companion suitable for him. And we would be like, well, of course. But as you think about what Adam was doing, he does all these. And I'm just thinking in the back of God's mind, why did he have him do all of that, name all of these animals and look at them all before he created Adam's companion Eve? I think God wanted Adam to know that in many ways you are alone. There's nothing here for you. Would any of these fit the bill? And the answer is no. So we see in the creation of Ben, in verse 20, it says there wasn't found for Adam a helper that was suitable for him. And in verses 21 and 22, God makes woman out of Adam's flesh. He takes a rib from Adam and he makes woman and he brings him a helper that is suitable for him. How proud God must have been as he said, look, Adam, you saw all these things. You saw the beauty of this creation. But here, I want to show you the crowning jewel of everything that I've made. The end of my creation is to make woman. A woman that is made perfectly to be a perfect companion and fully suitable for you and all of your needs. And there we see the beginning of God's institution of marriage. How excited Adam have to, had to be as he said, look, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She's going to be called woman because she was taken out of man. And if we were going to come and people are wondering, what's the deal with marriage? Is it just a social, social contract? 
Is it just something that, I don't know, is it any better than just living with somebody? Is, does it really matter if you're going to be with one person, if you're going to be monogamous or not? What, what, what's, the, what's the deal? And we can come and say, no, we believe that as we see the order in this world and we see the changing of the seasons and the rising of the sun and everything else that goes like clockwork, we believe that there's a creator that made us to be together, male and female, and he designed marriage for us. Just like this world works in perfect harmony if we'll listen to him and we'll listen to what he has said, our marriages, our relationships can show God's order and God's uh, design. God wanted it. That's why there's marriage. God designed it. That's why we want to listen to him. God gives guidelines for it, and that's why we're going to listen to our Lord and our Savior when he tells us what we need to do. Uh, verse 24, God then says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his, uh, joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Well, what happens within that marriage? You see a lot of different things as you look at Scripture, and we can't cover all of them tonight, but I want to mention a couple of things that happens in a God-designed marriage as you look at a few pictures in the Bible. Number one, when it comes to wives, I love the story of Genesis chapter 2 because you see the rightful place of woman. In the history of man, women have not been given their rightful place. Throughout the history of man in different societies and different uh, times in the past, it's been based upon physical strength. Women have been mistreated. Women have been used or owned as property. Women have been considered less of a citizen than other people. Women couldn't own property or do all these other things is when people were simply looking at this outward physical thing. And so many places where this message didn't go, women have faced a lot of persecution, a lot of uh, discrimination as well. But God's message is a woman isn't a second-class citizen. A woman was a specifically designed uh, individual for a perfect union that was made by God. Well, what do you see in Scripture? One that we see is wives ought to be lauded and loved. A couple passages you see there in Proverbs chapter 12. Uh, when we look at what women are, it says, A wife of noble character is her husband's crown, but a disgraceful wife is like decay in his bones. It says, look, when in a, within a God-given marriage, you see this woman that was going to be of noble character. And what happens? It is almost like that is the thing that that man can walk around with, and he takes great pride in it. Something, the fact that he is together, that he is joined with a woman who has noble character. And her husband is going to walk around and feel blessed because of the fact that he's with her. You see Proverbs chapter 31, as you see this description of a virtuous woman. It says, a wife of noble character, who can find she is worth far more than rubies? A godly good woman within a marriage says is priceless. Her price is worth far more than rubies. And as, as the women that are here tonight, as you think about your role within your marriage, within your family, within your home, the value that God places upon you is immense. You see Proverbs chapter 31, you see that she's lauded. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. For that woman who is going out and doing all these things, you see that God has placed the value on her. That's why she's so valuable. You see that throughout all of Scripture. But then you see whenever she's making these choices to follow God's plan, her children are going to see her and they're going to rise up and laud her. They're going to give her praise. Her husband is going to see the type of wife that she is and she is to be a woman that he can go out and say, man, my wife is such a blessing to my life. So she's to be lifted up, but you also see within marriage, within God's plan, she's to be loved. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, we looked at that a little bit last week. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, sanctify her having cleansed her by washing of the water with the word, that he may present her to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Husbands, within a godly marriage, it's God's plan for her to be loved. And to what extent? To the extent that Jesus loved his church. Jesus got up every day thinking about building his church. His behavior was going to be a certain way so that he could build his church. One day he would take the cross to Golgotha. Why? Because he wanted to build his church. He loved us, his people, and he was willing to do whatever it took for the betterment of his people. And now you see that women within God's plan are to be given that level of love. 
Time and again he says that, verse 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Once again he repeats it. Women are to be lauded, they are to be loved. A man ought to love her like he loves his own body. We don't hurt ourselves, we take care of ourselves. When we have needs, we immediately say, I wanna fulfill that need. And he says, within your marriage, men, she's to be loved. When she has a need, it is your time to take care of those needs for her, whatever they may be. He says, he who loves his own wife loves himself. Within God's plan, you have this idea of, oh, well, am I giving? No, really what's happening is whenever you give yourself to God's plan, you always reap what you sow and you reap things so much better. When we make a decision to make, make the hard choices, to be selfless, what happens? He says, if you love your wife, men, really what you're doing is you're loving yourself. Your life will never get better than what you can have whenever you make sure that your wife is loved and know that she is loved. As far as your relationship and your marital life is gonna be blessed in so many ways when you love your wife the way that she deserves to be that. Verse 33, you see that in Ephesians 5, every individual among you is to love his own wife as himself. So women are elevated, they are praised, they are loved. What happens with husbands? In a God's plan for marriage, husbands are responsible and they're respected. Ephesians chapter five, verse 21. You see, we mentioned last week, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ, this idea of mutual submission that you see within the church and within every relationship. But then it says, wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Here we see within God's plan, he made a decision. He made a designation within his guidelines for marriage. And that was for the husband to be head of the wife. But I think it's very important for us to realize that this is a position of leadership and it's not a position of lordship. Okay, we see that man were going to come together, husband and wife, they were going to leave their father and mother, they were going to become one flesh. You see this level of love and service that is to be given to the wife. And he didn't say, husband, you come in and now you are Lord over her in every way. He says, look, there's a responsibility given to men within a relationship. To the husbands that are here tonight, I want you to feel that responsibility. It's a great burden in many ways. If a burden is to be borne, whenever you have the head of a situation, who's in charge? Who is God going to ask? I see very few things in Scripture that say that God is going to come and ask those wives what exactly happened, but the man that has been placed with the responsibility of leading that home are going to be the men. So you have this responsibility that they have been given. Jesus taught us about what real leadership looked like. If you look in Matthew chapter 20, verse 25, he says, you know what people in the world do. If somebody says, oh, well, this person's the head, this person's in charge, this person is the leader, he says, well, the Gentiles, they lord it over other people. They hold their position that, well, I'm in charge, therefore I'm going to tell you what to do. But he says, verse 26 of Matthew 20, it's not to be this way among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you would be your servant. So as we look at the idea of God's plan for the home, he says, yes, the husband is going to be head of the wife, but what does spiritual leadership, what does leadership look like among God's people? It's servant leadership. Jesus showed that. Whenever there was a room full of people and everybody was about to have a meal and there wasn't a servant or a slave to wash the feet, what did our Savior show us a real leader does? He goes over and he girds himself with a towel and he gets down on his feet and he starts to wash every one of his apostles' feet. Why? Because he was the leader. And he was trying to teach them, you know what greatness is? Greatness is having a, a position in which you are responsible for things. And what you're, how you're going to use that position is you're going to serve, you're going to love, you're going to take care of somebody else in such a way that them following you will be easy to do. It's a responsibility that men are given, and as they give that, you also see the idea of respect. Uh, whenever you look at these passages, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, 
At the end of that, he says, you know, this, this picture that he's given where women are going to be praised, where they're going to be lauded, where they're going to be loved, where men are going to have this responsibility, you see that whenever a woman understands that her husband is going to be held responsible by the Lord, and whenever a woman sees that her husband loves her like the Lord does and like he loves herself, it's going to make her call to respect her husband that much easier. And at the end of this, you sort of see individually what are you looking for within God's plan the main things that women are looking for and the main things that men are looking for are going to be met what do women say time and again that they want they want love and affection men so many times how are they wired they are looking for respect whenever you see these needs within them God says you know what happens within this marriage relationship within my plan you see that everybody among you is to love his own wife as himself and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband and as those needs are being met so many ways God is putting us together in a way that will bless us Proverbs chapter 31 as we talked about that virtuous woman verse 23 one of the things that it said about her was her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land so you see this idea that she's doing all these other things and she is to be praised her children are praising her her husband praises her and she is living in such a way that this ultimate following of God's plan leads for him to be respected as well so men are also responsible and they're respected and finally you see within marriage that children are grounded and guided and we've spent a lot of time looking at the idea of children but I think this is so important because we see the effects of it in our society today uh, when you look at so many tragic events within our headlines violence that occurs whether it's school shootings whether it's muggings whether it's you know violence that's happening in our large cities time and again what do you see our prisons are full of individuals that have come from a situation many times of which the family has broken apart it's just a end result of ignoring God's plan because one of the things we're going to see is that God has a plan and Satan has a plan and many people have ignored God's plan so Satan's plan is always going to step in and many times who suffers the most when we ignore God's plan? Well, it's children. And scripture tells us what we're looking for. Children are going to be grounded by this. The marriage is supposed to be a blessing for the future of all society. We want to solve problems. If we can solve homes, if we want to solve problems in our own lives, if we can have better homes, we're going to have better children. We're going to have better grandchildren. The future of our society is going to be dependent on what we do as we raise children. And God's ideal plan is going to have two parents that are going to raise that child with their strengths and their weaknesses. It's been said it takes a village, and that's true. You have a lot of people that need help, but God's plan is it's going to start with these two, this father and the mother. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he won't depart from it. It's a key thing in teaching, and within the home, that's God's plan. Proverbs 14, verse 26. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children, it will be a refuge. As we face those bumpy days in marriages, as we face the challenges that are difficult at times, when we face times when we get tired, when maybe we are just passing, and we're saying, look, is this worth something that I want to continue to work towards? Do I want to make my marriage better? I think we need to think about these things. Our walk that we can have with our spouse can be something that can bless our children, it can bless others, it can bless that next generation. It can give them a fortress. It can be a refuge for our children as well. Psalm 128, I love this passage, and, and Barry had this in there, and I just thought it was a good idea on looking at God's entire plan. What does he want to do? Blessed are all who fear the Lord and walk in his ways. So when we see God's plan and we see his guidelines, we need to understand sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Sometimes we want to give up on those things. We'll face situations, and the world is telling us something else. But he says, look, blessed are all those who fear the Lord and walk in his ways. You'll eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like the fruitful vine within your house. Your sons will be like olive shoots around your table. This is the man blessed who fears the Lord. When we see his plan and say, look, I'm going to give that to us, God is telling us things that he wants for us. Uh, he wants to bless us with so many different things. So that's a little bit of God's plan. Uh, with the second part that I wanted us to consider is the idea of God's plan for marriage versus Satan's plan for marriage. 
compare and contrast. And we're going to have a couple different things that will be here again. I don't think that these are going to be brand new things for you, but I think they're things that we, we want to consider. We want to realize that this is what the world is coming at us with. And we also need to always ask ourselves some questions. So I'll try to guide you in some of those as we consider these thoughts. When God's plan comes along, you see that God hates divorce. And for Satan's plan, we need to understand that Satan loves divorce. Satan loves fighting. He likes all the mess that goes back and forth. He likes trying to split people up. He loves making people angry. He loves trying to uh, cause more problems, cause families to go against each other. He loves heartache. He loves pain, and he loves all the problems that come with divorce. If you look in, when you look in Scripture, God is going to make his, his way very plain. He says, I hate divorce. Malachi chapter uh, 2, verse 16. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel, and I hate a man covering himself with violence as well as his garment, says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. Other versions say, don't deal treacherously with the wife of your youth. God looks down and he says that I hate divorce. And as I've talked to individuals, you know who can tell me the most why God hates divorce are those who have suffered through it themselves. You meet somebody who has gone through the heartbreak of this and they understand what God wants. God wants a blessing. God wants you to be blessed. He wants you to have peace. He wants you to have joy. And he knows that whenever we open up our heart or our families or our lives into this option, we're opening up problems and heartaches that can come because of that. And God says, I hate divorce. God doesn't want anybody to deal with that. God doesn't want anybody to go through that. But we live in a society that when it comes to Satan's plan, many people are saying, oh, no, that's just, that's an easy way to go about it. I was hearing this week about somebody that had gone and they'd gotten married and they hadn't gone through the name swap yet. She hadn't taken on his name, probably for a couple of years, didn't do that. And whenever they, well, why haven't you done that? That's, that's a pretty big commitment to take on somebody's last name. You're married but you are worried about the level of commitment. Now, I'm not here to talk about what names you're taking or anything else, but there's a lot of people within our society that when it comes to the idea of getting out, you know, here we are as long as we both are happy. Forget till death do you part. Forget for richer or for poorer. As soon as there's a speed bump, as soon as there's a problem, seven years is the average date of the first divorce. Whenever it's a second marriage, it's even shorter than that. And many people go into marriage and they're like, ah, oh, divorce is just another option. I can make some choices in life, but what are you saying? You have a choice to change yourself and help do the best you can to help your sp spouse change and work through life together, or you just leave this problem and just jump into another one. And I'll just use divorce as a way that I don't have to change anything about me. I don't have to look within myself. I don't have to work with forgiveness. I don't have to work with kindness. I don't have to make any adjustments. I'll just move right on as if that's going to eliminate all the problems. And that's what the world is whispering to us that he wants us to do. But we see that God hates divorce while Satan loves it. Jesus was asked about it in his day. The Pharisees came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 19. And they come and ask him, said, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? People in Jesus' day were getting divorced for a lot of various reasons, and there were different debates within the religious world about what exactly gives a good enough reason for divorce. It sounds pretty familiar. People do that today. As they come and ask Jesus about marriage and divorce, he says, haven't you read what was in the very beginning? And Jesus doesn't go back to Deuteronomy where Moses' law was going to discuss the idea of divorce. He says, read what God did in Genesis chapter 2. He says, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Jesus says, God made you to be together. So they're no longer two but one flesh. Then Jesus adds this, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Jesus has come to reveal God's plan for us. What does he want for us? What are God's guidelines for this? And he says, you're not supposed to separate. They're going to then ask him, well, why was there divorce? Why was Moses going to uh, ask that? And I think the reason they probably asked that is because they may have heard Jesus at other times. 
If you're going to look in Luke chapter 16, verse 18, or Mark chapter 10, 11, and 12, in those two Gospels, if you didn't have the Gospel of Matthew and you just read Jesus' statement, Jesus came and he really said, look, I want you to be together. Mark chapter 10, verse 11 says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she is committing adultery. Jesus gives these guidelines and he gives no exception at all except to say, look, you're supposed to be married. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 8 was the one time where he was going to give one exception for that. They said, well, why did Moses say all these things? And he said, he said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not this way. Jesus was trying to point people back to say, look, I want to get you back to what God really made marriage for. And that was to stay together, to work through these things. And then he went on and said this, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another person commits adultery. So in Matthew chapter 19 is the only time where Jesus is going to give any reason for someone to separate from their spouse and then go and find another spouse would be if their spouse had been sexually unfaithful to them. God's plan was one man and one woman for life with only one exception to marry again. Satan's plan is do whatever feels right in the moment. When you get too angry and you're frustrated, just give up. Head out, move out. Don't work through problems. Don't communicate through it all. Get frustrated, throw your hands up in the air, thinks it's all up to you, and just say, forget it, I'm done. Why? Because he loves turmoil. He loves children during formative years running around trying to figure out what exactly is going on with home and what's happening. He wants us to take our eye off of our focus and have all the different things that will continue to follow through. I remember I was talking to a gentleman. He was probably about 65 years old, and he was talking about his wife. And, he, and at that point, he said, well, when my wife was a teenager, her parents were divorced, but my wife will always be the daughter of divorced parents. Years down the road, that was still the case. Now, if you want to sit here and look at studies today, you know what people are going to say? Oh, it's better for the kids. That's what it's going to be. You're going to have all of these messages that say, you know what? Ignore God's plan. Forget working through things, and it'll be better anyways. The messages many times are loud and clear. And again, every situation is individual. But what I want you to see with God's plan, and I think that's what Jesus was saying and what he'd want us to know tonight, is he wants us to be together. He wants us to work through difficulties. He wants us to honor God's idea of marriage with whatever it may take. Second thing that I would say when it comes to the contrast between these two is God's plan emphasizes focusing on my spouse's needs while Satan's plan causes one to focus on his or her own needs. What are you going to do? God's plan says, I want you to focus on what your spouse needs tonight. Satan's plan says, I want you to think about what you want tonight. As you think about that and you think about what motivates your actions and your feelings and your interactions and what you do as you go back and forth, what questions are you asking? What am I doing to meet the needs of my spouse? Or are you here tonight going, well, what is my spouse doing to meet my needs? Being selfish and having a happy marriage I believe that's impossible to do. If you come and you only think about what you need and you think about what someone else and how they're not meeting your needs and the things that you would want, see, you can never want them to do something in a way that you can control them and make decisions to make them do what you want them to do. But you can always say, what am I doing to try to make sure that my spouse's needs are met? And you'll always gain traction on that front. And many times what happens is as you sow those seeds of saying, what exactly does he need? What does she need? How can I figure out how to take care of them in a better way? Whenever I come at that in a selfless way, you know what's going to happen? You're going to be married to somebody whose needs are, needs are being met. And many times that can become reciprocal within our marriages. To sit around and wait for your needs to be met first is a roadmap for bitterness and disappointment. And it simply doesn't work. But you can take actions to try to, I'm going to decide to act my way into a better way of thinking. What does scripture say? Uh, Paul reminds us in Acts chapter 20 verse 35 about the words of Jesus. 
Jesus says, I want to remind you, it's more blessed to give than to receive. We don't think about that in lines of the idea of our marriage and our relationships, but I want to ask you right now, within your relationship, if you're here and you're married, who is giving more and who is wanting to get more? Because as you look at that, whenever you have the idea of giving, Jesus says it is more blessed to give than to receive. Do you really believe that? You say, well, no, Jesus, actually, I'm really looking to get some things before I decide to give again. Jesus says we can be blessed when we make a decision to be selfless and to give to other people. Uh, It's true that life is a game of give and take, but I really do believe that for marriages and the very best marriages, you know what people do? They decide to continually give to each other. They're getting almost in a contest. She did this for me, well, I'm gonna do this for her. And he did this for me and I'm gonna do this for him. And you're looking for opportunities to say, how can I give to you? And what happens is every time you get, you can successfully give to someone any time that you want. You cannot successfully receive. When you say, well, I wish that he would, I wish that she would, you can't control what they're gonna do at this moment. You can control whether or not they are receiving the things that they need by making your decisions. Jesus also told us, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, we have the golden rule. I think it applies so well within our marriages. So in everything due to others, what you would have them do to you, this sums up the law and the prophets. Is the golden rule being followed? Would you want him, would you want her to do this, you know, in this situation? And so many times we think about that, and it's kind of sad because it is a struggle. Many times we may act better around strangers than we act around those who are closest to us. And that's one of those things that we do when we get into a rut and we say, look, I, I don't, you know, when I really relook at some of these things, I think I've thrown the golden rule out of my own house. I know that it works at work. I know that it works with other people. Well, it also works with our spouse, and we want to make sure that we do this. Well, in order to do that, I want to encourage you on, on something. In order to do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, you're going to have to know that person. Uh, If you haven't been married for a long period of time, and maybe even if you have for a long period of time, I would ask you, how well do you know your spouse? To do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, you can sit there and say, well, this is what I would want, and maybe your spouse doesn't know what you'd want because they don't know you well enough. And at times we need to stop and we need to have moments in our marriages where we say, I just need to get to know you better. You can be married for a long time and say, well, yeah, I'll do you. Well, maybe that was 10 years ago and kids came along and I got distracted and I really don't know what your dreams are right now. I don't really know what you're looking for. What do you need in this stage of life? Or maybe you just got married and you're saying, look, I just thought we just loved each other and that's all it was. Well, it's more complicated than that, isn't it? You have to sit there and study your spouse. Whenever you want to be good at something, you have to put in the time and energy. And you sit there and think about how well do you love your spouse, uh, spouses. Uh, you think about the idea of other things that we know really well. Uh, I've got some guys at their fantasy football team right now. They've spent untold hours looking at that. Now, you want to talk about different players and ratings and scores and wins a bye week and all these other things I could bring up that some of you are going, I don't know what he's talking about. They spend all kinds of time knowing that. It comes to your hobbies. You've got a car engine. Oh, I can tell you about the cars, I can tell you about the brakes, the transmission, I can tell you all of these things. And you say, well, what about your spouse? We can sit there and study all kinds of things that we're interested in, and then I want you to compare the person you're sharing life with. Have you gotten to where you can answer many questions? Well, if that's where we are tonight, what do we do? We go home and start asking questions again. Wives, are you continually looking for ways to be the spouse that your husband wants to be? Husbands, are you sitting there and still trying to ask your wife and trying to get to know her and see what her needs are because they're going to change as you continue on with marriage as well? Uh, We've had studies on the five love languages. Uh, We've got to be careful whenever you look at that, that you can show somebody you love them, but if you're just loving them the way that you would receive love, it may not be getting the message across. And to go home tonight and say, what do I need to do to make you feel loved? Well, that's a part of that golden rule. Well, I want to do to you the things that you would want done. I want to be the person that you would want me to be. And you sort of ask those questions. What do you need me to do? Philippians chapter 2 is such a beautiful passage. It's really written, uh, addressed in the church, but I think it just applies so well to our position in our homes as well. 
Imagine this home and this spousal relationship. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Within our relationships within the home, I believe that can be a challenge for all of us. Are we being arrogant instead of humble? Are we being selfish instead of selfless? Are we looking at the situation saying, look, this is what I want, or are we saying, what do you need? And as we do all of these things, I believe we'll see that there's nowhere that this is more needed uh, than within our homes and within a marriage. Uh, one of the things that I really believe about our homes is that's really the greatest test of our discipleship. You know, we sit there and think, oh, I want to walk with God and I want to be what God wants me to be. And we may think about when we go to work or we think about what we do when we come to worship him or we think about some way that we're serving or some type of work that we could be involved in in the church. And I just really believe the greatest thing that you can do for the church is to go home and be the man that your wife needs you to be. To go home as a spouse, be a wife and say, I want to be the wife that my husband needs me to be. If I can be loving in my home, if I can be patient in my home, if I can be kind, if I can be humble, if I can be forgiving, if I can do all these things in the situation with the people that are closest to me, I believe you're going to find that as you leave the home, those other situations may be so much easier. So we really sit here and we see all the things that God wants us to be. And as we become what God wants us to be, that makes us better within the home. And as we look at our challenges, I think that's why God tells us, look, I don't want you to throw away what's happening in the home and move on to the next situation. This is your greatest test for whether or not you are one of my disciples. Are you following me in every way, even when it's difficult? Well, sometimes marriages get difficult and relationships get strained and forgiveness is needed and grace and mercy is called for and of all places that we show what God has done for us to someone else he wants us to do that within our homes doesn't make it easy but I think that's where God is calling us to really show I'm going to be like my savior even in my home especially in my home Number three, I would say to you tonight that God's plan brings about fulfilled relationships while Satan's plan brings about relationships that are never good enough. Uh, with Satan's plan, he wants you to always be chasing the wind. He wants to bring you to some high and then get you to try to continue to chase to see if I can get this high again. He wants you to spend money or it's going to be an activity or it's going to be something else. And he wants you to constantly chase things that are superficial and temporary. Satan's plan is for cheap and easy. Satan's plan is for something to be totally disposable. God's plan is going to be different. God's plan is going to come and say, look, I want you to focus on other, the things that are eternal and purposeful. Satan's plan treats people like they're just objects for you to use. They're supposed to give to you, and if not, you simply throw them away. But God's plan is about fulfillment. Uh, we've heard many times, good things come to those who wait. Nothing worthwhile comes easy. Uh, you reap what you sow. And I think that is so important for us. God's plan ultimately wants to fulfill us. How is he going to do that? God's plan is going to give us the emotional needs uh, that they can be fulfilled. Companionship through ups and downs, through difficulties of life, he wants to fulfill us. He wants to help us with financial needs. You can look at studies time and again. One from Ohio State said married couples after 10 years had, um, had almost four times as much in saving as singles. Why? Because as you get together and you eliminate those things and you focus, uh, marriage is going to be blessed in finan uh, financially uh, in so many different ways. Physical needs are going to be fulfilled. Satan's plan is going to say, look, just focus on outward beauty, and outward beauty fades, fades and changes. God's way says, I want you to appreciate inward beauty. What happens? That becomes sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. When you say, look, I'm going to love somebody because of what is going on within their life and who she is or who he is, age is never going to take that away, and it's only become deep, deeper. It's going to meet our needs when it comes to child rearing as well. Number four, God's plans provide openness and transparent, transparency, while Satan's way provides deception and dishonesty. Very important when you look at this, God wants you to be open. God wants you to be honest. God doesn't want things to be hidden. What does Satan want? He wants us to hide things from each other. 
He wants us to be uh, deceitful. God's plan is based on the principle of honesty is the best policy. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Is that true within your home? Whenever you start playing with that, you're playing with fire in so many ways. Because many times as you do something, if I'm not open, if I'm hiding something, if I've lied about something, really the dishonesty and trying to hide something is worse maybe even than the offense that was, uh, that was committed. Uh, you can forgive an offender, but it's going to take time for a spouse that has lost trust to ever get that back. John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus was talking about Satan. He says, whenever he speaks, he speaks a lie. He speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and a father of lies. Satan loves marriages that are going through this idea of lying. We think we can lie to hide something, to make something smooth, make something easier. It never works. Satan is the father of lies. So as we think about that tonight, are there things that we're keeping from our spouse? Are you willing to be open and transparent? Do you love them enough to give them the transparency they need? I would also say, if your spouse is vulnerable enough to be open and honest with you about their failings, about things that they're struggling with because they want your relationship to be better, are you willing to be forgiving? Are you willing to offer mercy? Are you willing to be graceful towards them? As they take that step, is that saying, okay, look, we've got a lot to deal with, but we're going to work through these things. Both of these characteristics are going to be needed in God's plan. Because what we know is everyone in the world is going to let us down, including our spouse, at times. The question is, what are you going to do in those moments? In the times when marriage isn't everything that you want it to be. Uh, we talk many times about, yeah, people have been married a long time. Yeah, there's been a lot of ups and downs. Well, that's true. But as we get through those in those moments, many times we lose the picture of God's plan. We lose the idea of what we want to be. And we have to make sure to remember in those down times to hold on. Well, a couple of things. Our slides are up. Our time is up. I wasn't watching the camera quite as good. If you look at the next one, there's some challenges to putting God first in our marriages. Uh, some of you are going to be here and your spouse may not be as focused on the Lord as you are right now. And that can be a challenge that you're going to have to work through. What you can do is control half of your marriage. And that's going to be who you are and what you're choosing to be. Uh, we can be too busy. That happens. Uh, praying together, doing spiritual things together. Maybe if that's something that is new to you, it's going to take some getting used to. But that's okay. It just takes time. Uh, double standards. If we're acting like we're going to serve God, but in our lives we're not, we can't serve God and Satan at the same time. With some of these things, we're going to have to make a choice. Family demands, busyness can happen. Coming in the rut of just going through the motions, sometimes we have to wake up from these things. So I want to give you a few suggestions for putting God in the center of your marriage. Number one, I would simply say Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek God first. Individually, take time for your walk with God. We talk about a lot of marriage and we talk about all these different things that we can do in a relationship, but I believe if two people aren't really focused on God, if you're not really focused on God, you're never going to really be the husband you need to be. If your relationship with God is not right, you're never going to be the spouse that he intends for you to be because he's the one that will empower you to be what you need to be. You can improve this half of your marriage and it can be done regardless of your spouse. What does he tell us? Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. I would tell you tonight that if you're wanting to walk closer with him, the first uh, walk closer in your relationship with your spouse, make sure that you're walking closer with God. Ask God's spirit to move within your life. Ask him to lead you and to change you. Help him to take you to repentance when that's needed. Ask him to help you to offer forgiveness just like God has forgiven you and to help your choices reflect his great call and purpose for your life individually seek God first. And then secondly, as a couple, do that as well. How do you do that? Well, you're here tonight. I think that's a great choice. You sit there and have opportunities where we come and worship together, but I want to encourage you to do more than just coming here. I think a spiritual relationship is going to take conversation. It's going to take more than simple class or lessons, but you need to talk about spiritual things. That may be something that you're going to do tonight. Where are you spiritually right now? Where are you with God? Get a feeling for each other. Learn through, walk through that, and see how you can help each other be what God wants you to be. I would encourage you to be involved in kingdom work. You want to work together? We need to do some things together. What can we do within the church?
That's been something that's been a blessing to my life for 26 years of our marriage is wherever we were, we found God's people, we found a purpose, and we said, okay, well, what can we do here? And together, we're able to find whatever it may be. It doesn't have to be something big. It's something that you're just going to look to work to together and do it together for the Lord, and it is so rewarding. Uh, as a couple, be transparent. Share weakness. Share temptations. Those can be uncomfortable. Those can be difficult things. But ultimately, what's going to happen? God's going to enable you to help each other get through those. And finally, I would say, uh, be disciplined. Uh, take time every day together with God. Spend time together in devotion. You can have those. Pray together about all of these various things and make a decision that we're going to work on God together. As we come together, he blesses us in so many ways. Well, I appreciate your attention. I hope you've heard God's word. I hope that it can touch your heart, that God can open your heart uh, to the things that are needed so ultimately we can all be more blessed in our lives. Tonight, the Lord's invitation is open. Uh, we want to help you in whatever way that we can. Uh, we want to help you if you were ready to become a Christian, if you're ready to have more conversations, or maybe within your marriage you need to have conversations. Again, grab any of us at any time. We want to praise God in all that we do. If we can help you in any way, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. I am I no more. I've been bought with blood, and I am I no more. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Jesus is my Lord. He will come again. He will come again. And he'll take me home. Yes, he will come. Be seated. Tonight, Randy and Hannah Mitchell have come forward, and uh, they said we've been. They're newly married. And they said that we've been struggling in our marriage, and they want prayers from the congregation to help them along those lines. Uh, God wants to bless you, and He will. Uh, but again, it takes openness, it takes courage to do that, and, and we're thankful for your example uh, tonight as you come forward to expressing that need. Uh, I hope that all of us will take from that example as well, uh, to speak up, to make changes, to make those times. Sometimes it's private, sometimes it's public as well, but every time we want to be a place where we can pray for one another. I'm very uh, thankful for that opportunity. I'm going to ask Jim Pollard, if he will, he's going to come up and lead us in a closing uh, prayer tonight and that he will pray for Randy and Hannah as, as we're dismissed as well. Let us pray. Our most dear Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you in prayer, thanking you for all that you do for us. We're thankful, dear Lord, for your word. We're thankful for the guidance you give us. Help us, dear Lord, to have the humility and the willingness to follow your word, to follow your will, to do what you would have us to do. Help us to overcome the devil and his temptations as we've looked tonight. Uh, his ways are so contrary to yours, and so many times we can be led astray. Give us the strength, dear Lord, and, and the courage uh, to stand against him, to resist him, and to draw close to you. Help us to seek your ways uh, daily in our lives, in our work. Uh, in our families, especially in our marriages. Help us, dear Lord, to uh, put all other things away and simply focus on what your word says and what your instructions are for us. We know, dear Lord, that you care greatly for us and that uh, your word is there to help us. Help us to uh, be aware of that and lean upon that and truly trust you uh, and trust you to guide us in our lives. 
Dear Lord, we want to bring Randy and Hannah before you. We're thankful, dear Lord, for uh, their willingness to to come and, and to say they need prayers and that they need uh, help in their marriage. We pray that you will strengthen them. We pray, dear Lord, that you will uh, give them strength and courage to face the challenges that uh, they come across each day. We pray for that for all of us, dear Lord, that you continue to be with us and, and watch over us and bless us. Uh, help us, dear Lord, to be the example we need to be for others. Help us to show you living in us and help us to show the uh, to take your word with us and share your gospel at every opportunity that we have. Dear Lord, we do ask that you forgive each of us of our sins and our shortcomings. We know that uh, uh, oftentimes we fail you, but we are so thankful for Jesus and the ultimate sacrifice made on our behalf that we can uh, have forgiveness of our sins and hope of heaven one day. As all these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>